One, two, three. Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I am your host, DK. And with me, as always, is my lovely co-host, Luxurious Lou. I think I've said that one yeah, already. Yeah, I think we've got that one like three times. How about... Uh, How about... Oh, what's we that, what's we that, Loudness okay? Lou? Yeah, we did. Loofs Lou. We, had, we said Loudness Meter Lou. Uh, Bus Glue Lou, we said that one. I mean, Luffy Ooh. is an anime character. Uh, Lu- Lugio. Lu- uh, we got Lugio. Lucius. Damn. Lucius huh? Lou. <laughs> Lucius Lou. Lucius Malfoy. Is that um, Malfoy? Yeah. Damn. There yeah. you go. A little uh, there HP you go. reference. Why not just Lulu? <laughs> Lulu. <laughs> we'll Lulu go Lemon. With... So Lemon well, Lou. <laughs> there you go. Welcome to the so welcome to the Mixing Music Podcast. <laughs> and today, not just with me and Lou, we have a special guest. The wonderful mix engineer, entrepreneur, father, family man, father, well, father of two girls, Daddy's studio home. owner, mixer, Grammy winner, Woo! all that jazz, hey. hype, hype man, <laughs> Jesse Ray Ernster. Hey. How you doing? What's up, guys? <laughs> Damn, could I get like a wrestling bell? Like, ding, ding. Ding, ding. <laughs> In this corner. <laughs> We've got weighing in at 202 pounds. <laughs> I don't know how how much you weigh, but yeah, there you go. My, dude, it's it's so I've been playing basketball every Wednesday night and uh I'm a buck 30 and whenever really? they set picks, whenever they set picks, I just bounce right to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you really a buck 30? I'm a buck 35, yeah. Dude, I'm 2 buck 60. They <laughs> Damn! All right, now you. I'm see like the exactly difference. in the middle of both of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so uh, um, on that note, well, we're so excited to have you back on the show, Jesse. We're so grateful to have you back on. We're I, we know that you're just an excitable human being, a great person to be around. So we're gonna have some great conversations today. You know what we wanted to talk about is you posted on Instagram recently saying, "Who else is getting excited about mixing again?" Uh, oh yeah. And you know what? This topic has been on my mind recently because I've kind of been on the same boat as of the last couple weeks. So tell me about your process. What happened that made you have to get excited about it again? And what are you excited about now? Yeah, it's, it's been like the right combination of the right projects coming in that are kind of defying all of my, my typical methods and, and challenging me. Like for the last two years, I've been like really pushing towards this like open, you know, nothing on the mix bus, a lot of headroom and, you know, quieter mixes and just this, this space thing and this big low end. And, and now I'm <laughs> like kind of going back on all of that and like loading up the mix bus, making just stupid, ignorant moves and moving fast and just head banging while I'm mixing, having fun. And just turning things up, you know, it's it's distorting. It's it's not perfect, but it's like I feel like I'm getting way more energy across the finish line than than before. And and I'm trying to defy like my my habit of uh, over cleaning things up. <laughs> and you know what? I could resonate with that because I feel like when I was working with uh, this artist Jalen, one of the mixes that I was really proud about, I was literally they make fun of me because I was sitting in the chair just mixing. You know, the whole time. Right. But it was just feeling excited about the mix that made the mix translate. Absolutely, man. It's do you do you feel like that's a direct correlation every time? Like when you guys look through your mix reel of like your you know, or your master reel of your like your favorite work that you've ever done. Is I it think always so, cause I you feel like a personal attachment, do you not? Like yeah. I feel like when you have a personal attachment to the work you do, you just inherently do not more technical work but rather more creative work. There's still the technical side of it because it's just ingrained in ourselves as engineers. But when you find a way to bring out the creativity with the technical in a, in a positive way, because you feel that way about the record, like it really shows for it. You know, when you're not really excited about a mix and you just clean it up and then you're like, well, this is better, but is it creatively better? Like when you feel creative about it, like that's, that's when the mixes I've heard, like we said it before, like, when you hear an old mix, are you ever proud of it? It's only the ones that I was ever really feeling excited about that I'm proud of. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you find that it's the same with uh, working with human beings that uh, that are that you have a connection with that are maybe you've you've shared some sort of 
yeah. empathetic, uh, you know, closeness or sharing of stories or experiences or there, there's some sort of uh, good morale there before you start the mix? I think so. What about you, DK? Yeah, no, absolutely. On my end of stuff, I hate to say this, but there's like a slight narcissistic part of me that loves being the hero in their story. <laughs> and like, I love it when they come in and, and this is really bad, but I'll be honest. Like, I love it when they come in and they're like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. And they leave. I don't know. It doesn't matter what I did, but the point is that they leave so happy. I love it when artists come in and they leave like, oh my gosh, I'm the best artist ever. Nobody can yep. stop me. And I'm like, yes. I'm coming for you, Kanye. Like, yeah, like I love I love it when an artist like comes out feeling like that because I did my job. Like I'm I'm I love being a good ass support character for their story. Yeah. Man. There's a part of that. Uh, yeah, what about that, you, Jesse? I Yeah, you know, I, I I the reason I asked this question is because I was I was doing the thing that I think we all do where we, you know, some new projects come out and we start to reorder our our mix reel because that's that's one of the first places that potential clients reach for when they, you know, access your, either your link tree or your website or your Spotify playlist. And I was going through and I realized like, man, my, my top five favorite songs are, maybe this isn't the right way to do it. And I would love your guys' input, but I mean, I'm tempted to like put the bigger names first, but just because, oh, somebody will have heard of that. That's cool. I'm attached to this. That should be the name at the top. But like my favorite mixes I ever did were were from like indie artists <laughs> that were just yeah. like that are like some of my best friends where we I remember the story of, you know, it, it maybe it wasn't even the most fun mix. Maybe we spent like three full days on it and I was frustrated at the time. But we were in the trenches together and we were committed. And then we went to In N Out Burger and it, you know, that funny thing happened in the parking lot or whatever it is. There's this human connection that that I think takes the the finished product and the art so much further. I feel like that's why fans love to see their favorite artists do these little docu series that are these little kind of movies and and making ofs and behind the scenes they stuff. They want to feel more connected. Totally. Yeah. I th I think this is actually a really good point to make, which is the idea of I do think that especially now in the days in like the age of education, self-education and content available I feel like a great underlying factor about all of this and the emotional state of music comes into, I think sometimes people are taking this too seriously. Mm. And I don't mean to say, I don't mean to lower the standard, right? I, I'm not trying to lower the level of the expectation, the standard, but at the same time, like what we do is truly a creative endeavor. And I think we as humans, we tend to take ourselves too seriously. To be honest, it's it's true, but it's it's kind of funny because I actually resonated with what he was talking about about organizing your list. Yeah, sure, you want to put like the biggest artists. I mean, you were putting together your portfolio back together for your website, like yeah, reorganizing. Yeah, so the it. website is now live uh, after like a year, maybe less, of not being live anymore. <laughs> like I just let it lapse because I didn't know if that was actually getting traction or not. But once uh, once we started doing more and getting busier again, I'm like, it's it's a good idea to do it. And the biggest dilemma I had wasn't necessarily, um, you know, putting your credits and all that. It was what to write about yourself. Like, who are you? And then showcasing the work that you've done. Like, sure, you could, just like Jesse said, you know, you could put your big names first. But if it's not your proudest work or the work you're trying to do, because uh, I'll be honest, I grew up in rock. You know, I love rock. But I yeah, know that rock too. isn't selling as much <laughs> as it used to, you know, and that's that's cool. But I still really love R and B and soul. So on my website, I showcase more R and B and soul and rock than I do trap. Even though I do a lot of trap, uh, <laughs> but you know, my favorite records, like growing up, are still my favorite records now. So mm -hmm. I feel the same way about showcasing the music. I want to show the records that I'm most fond of, so that hopefully it attracts that type of clientele rather than check it out. I got a plaque with this song, yeah. but I'm not exactly trying to do this song all the time. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. I find myself catering my portfolio based on who I want to have as a client in the mm -hmm. future. Yeah. How has your experience been? What, so what did you end up deciding as far as putting your portfolio together? Reorganizing it? Um, just putting kind of a combination of both, you know. Uh, maybe like my favorite mix from a couple of the bigger artists at the top and then 
sort of below that, then I dive into the deeper catalog stuff of, of things people haven't heard of. And, and then a little below that, then I put kind of the rock and live instrumentation stuff together because a small amount of my work ends up being like, you know, where I'll get calls because like, you know, not everybody can mix a kit that's been multi mic That's like, that's kind of something that that's I think yeah. was yeah. important maybe closer to a decade ago and, and has lost importance. Hopefully it's coming back. But I, I love seen it come I, back. Yeah. I love that you brought up the website because I think that uh, that could be a cool way to go. Um, uh, looping back to what Lou said about the website and what you said, D, about the um, taking ourselves too seriously. I think that that's, I'm trying to think of where we all got the idea that we need to like present our website as if it's like a, uh, <laughs> an M. Night Shyamalan movie or something. <laughs> you know, like we're just, we're, we're up on this pedestal and it's always in the third person. I was just telling my wife Stella this. I was like, Man, I, I look at other mixers' sites for inspiration. Like, what are they doing? What's working for them? And it's always in the third person. And I know for a mm -hmm. fact, it's these guys that are writing their own bio. Why are we in the third person? That's why I had such a hard time with it. Because I'm like, I wrote my bio in first person. And I also felt really bad about doing that. Because I was like, am I self-promoting in a weird way? Am I making myself sound weird? Like, I think the third person disconnect makes the intimidation of it all less. Mm -hmm. For my, mine's, my personal one, the DKMixes.com one, is totally first person and is Good. really out of date. <laughs> <laughs> really out of date. But uh, What's out of date yeah. about it? No, it's just old stuff. Old, like, like old I have house. brown hair all around. I don't have any color in my hair. Yeah. That's <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, just old pictures. I, I have not taken any headshots at all recently at least by myself because i only take family pictures so i do not have any solo pictures mm. so oh. when i when i submitted music for like the forbes nomination thing or submitted photos and information for that um they're like we need high res photos for this application for your nominee page and uh and i was going through my thing my last my high res photos that i have my last ones are for like 2018 you should see the one i have for you on <laughs> the right. website yeah. You know you're on my website, right? Really? You didn't know <laughs> yeah. this? Oh, yeah. actually, I did. Yeah, I saw that. I saw yeah. that. <laughs> you're there, dude. You didn't have a mustache. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, for if anybody's watching on YouTube, and if you're not watching on YouTube, you should come over to YouTube and subscribe. Go to mixingmusicpodcast.com. Um, and you can smash find like and subscribe. Smash like, like and subscribe. Like smash it like it's a down smash and super smash. Bros. There you go. Like, there you go. <laughs> off edge that shit. Bop and it, then, twist it, pull it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see if if you've wondered why I have a mustache, um, it's because every year since high school, since about junior year of high school, yes, I've been able to grow facial hair that long as an Asian person, which is incredible. Dude, I can't even grow it as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing I. this every November, and it wasn't until the last three or four years ago when it started like growing fuller and it looked decent. Because <clears throat> in high school, I looked like a young creep. <laughs> now I just look like a handsome Mexican. <laughs> yes, you do, man. Do you speak Spanish? I do not. <laughs> Dude, D, I think that the, having the family photos thing works, though. I have this theory. I think so. That as soon as you, I'm, I'm actually going to see Bob Clear Mountain later this week. I'm going to like get to meet a hero of mine, and I want to ask him. This. Yeah. I'm going to say like, yeah. "Dude, I have a theory about you know audio engineers, producers. As soon as they become dads." I think there is a heightened sense of musicality and just knowledge that we're instantly just the universe <laughs> the just universe throws just it into <laughs> yeah it just shoves it down we go super scion and it's like a Mega Man X armor upgrade it's just <laughs> doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean so like that's the way that I, I approached my website recently I was like man everybody reads these first person Instagram bios anyway that's the language people know that's the, that's how I should do it like hey everybody. I'm a mixer guy. I'm a dad. <laughs> I live in LA. I, I think uh, I'm pretty good at what I do. You know, it might be a good fit. Let's try a mix out. If it's not, cool. We'll, we'll keep going. We can still be friends. <laughs> My favorite one is when there's like no description, just bullet points. It says mixing engineer and then that's it. <laughs> and you're like, okay. No, that's a good one. I mean, no, it's, no, no, it's, it is. But I'm like, no link in the bio, no nothing. nothing. Okay, I'm just gonna look at your photos then, dude. And there then are it's not even a single photo of music or anything. It's like hiking. <laughs> um, there are some people though who are like, it, it, it is their shtick that they are under the radar. 
like my buddy yeah. Andrew Mori, who is based out of New York, uh, probably my favorite mixer of our like generation, absolute genius. Uh, his whole deal is that he doesn't have like anything about him anywhere, and he is like completely under the radar. And he's like a, you know, his his thing is best kept secret. That's kind of like a, that's his attack, right? So if whatever is going to work for anybody. I used to do the thing. I was like, I, like that. I was guilty of what I preach against now. I was like, you know, mixing engineer, live guitarist, session guitarist, mastering engineer, tracking engineer, songwriter, producer, <laughs> vocal coach, guitar teacher, drummer, gamer extraordinaire, Twitch star, photo guy. Like, whoa. I, like Only 17. Fan. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> man. And I, I really wasn't good at any one thing at all. So, well, there's, um, I mean, there's two. Neither are correct i think they're both correct but what is it the jack of all trades but a master of none but if you but there's another version that says a jack of all trades but a master of none is still better than a master, than a master of one, of one. Mm. so how but, come, I mean, so it doesn't it, think, there's truth in it's both a directions careful balance. there's there's truth in both directions i need yeah. you to yeah. explain it to me though cuz i i don't even understand that i've heard that before and it confused me then and it's it's confusing well, me, me now let me see if i got what you said right <laughs> so because I think I understand and agree with what you're saying. Like, if if you said all you do, like recently I've uh, started uh, almost taking exclusively mastering. I still mix for many of my clients, but I have seen where some people hit me up and they say like, "Oh, so you don't mix anymore?" It's like, no. I mean, for certain clients, as long as they're willing to pay my mixing rates and stuff, I'll still do it, depending on the record. But uh, yeah, I mean, on paper, I'm just a mastering engineer. That's uh, generally speaking what I'm looking to be doing in the future. They're like, oh, because I sent a mix to somebody else thinking you don't do it anymore. So I lost a part of income because of the confusion. So I think Got I've it. been thinking about this a lot too. I think the concept is people want to work with and hang out, be friends with me, right? Not the Twitch streamer me, not the podcast host mm -hmm. me. I just happen to host a podcast, right? And happen to do a Twitch stream and happen to do all these different things, happen to be a mix engineer. I think that there's two different sides of this. And the reason why being a master of one is better is for branding. Like there's actual data that backs this up. Any sort of content marketing, it always talks about niching into your, there's like statistical data that backs behind why you want to talk about one thing and do one thing, get really damn good at that one thing to talk about, right? But at the same time, I think people will have a hard time finding that one thing and expecting that upon them. Like, like some people that are very high levels of openness want to try many different things. As a creative who usually have high levels of openness, there's um, they want to try many different things. If you have ADHD, this is a common thing as well. Like You get obsessed with certain different things. Like right now, I'm starting to really get obsessed with basketball again. If I let that kind of take course in my life, I'm going to play like four or five times a week <laughs> if I let it really <laughs> rampage in my life. But um, so... I think that, but the thing is like when it comes to being a master, like, but it's still not as important as being a master of, of, or better than a master of one. And I think the reason why being a jack of all trades is still important is to help you discover if you like one thing or if you are high levels of openness. Like my wife can sit down and even though she's not an audio engineer, she enjoys prepping sessions. When, when I had her prep sessions a couple years ago, she was like, I can sit down and I know what to do and I could do tedious work and I can focus and I enjoy that I can focus. But if you try to get me to sit down and prep sessions for someone else, I will kill myself. <laughs> you know? Like, I just can't do it. Like, I have to be playing basketball and I have to be Twitch streaming and I have to be doing this because that's me. So, oh. and, and, and I think that like some people think that you have to do one thing because the data backs up. You have to niche into one thing. But honestly, you should do you. And yes, it may be harder to be a marketing person and an engineer and an artist. But at the same time, it doesn't mean you can't. Absolutely. And, and I think we're getting into something deeper. I think that uh, this is sort of this hierarchy of inner needs as human beings, right? We, uh, we are desperate for fulfillment. <laughs> and how much would you be missing out on the things that are truly bringing you fulfillment and joy if you just forced yourself out of, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I can't do that. I, it's like, no, nah, you know? Yeah. And I think, I, I'm, I'm, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lou. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I was just going to say, I think it's kind of like what DK was talking about, where it's more about people wanting to be with you. It's about building that relationship, kind of like how we were talking about which records are we most proud of when we work on them. It's the ones that we had the biggest connection with. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like ultimately it comes down to, you know, 
is your client really your client? Or are they just hiring you because of the title? Hmm. But what has your journey been so far with inner needs? Because I know that I know that's been on everybody's minds recently, especially I, we don't even get we won't even get started on mental health, but um, especially like being a dad and you doing what seems like so many things on the outside. I yeah, mean, it you, seems like you've, you've been really busy. You've been making copyright writing articles as well. You wrote articles in the past for Music Tech. You've you've now released After a plugin, SOS, I believe. Yeah, yeah, and you've now released and helped develop a plugin under your own brand. You've released sample packs. You're you're a, a phenomenal dad, and and I would assume husband. <laughs> uh, I'm, granted, I'm not carefully watching your relationship with your wife. <laughs> Nor do I have a sample of that love to distinguish. You know. <laughs> But I think the question goes back to you is Jess or yeah, Jesse, how have how have you been finding happiness? Forget forget productivity. How have you been finding happiness recently? Man, that's great. I, I am super easy though, you know? I am I am like maybe to a fault. I'm just uh <laughs> I don't want to say like uh, overtly content, but I, I it, it definitely doesn't take a lot, you know, and there's a certain level of work that needs to come in to where I'm, where that level of, of worry and stress and anxiety about, you know, income and safety and providing for the family and all that can go away. So there's kind of that, that, you know, threshold of, of amount of work that needs to come in. And then, you know, then that worry is out the door. After that, there's, there's the little things. I like to be able to exercise a few times a week and hang with the kids. And, but I, I definitely need, I'm ADHD too, you know, I need, so I need, I need me time in the studio. That, that's been kind of like the biggest adjustment to like switching to family life is, you know, for the last like 15 years before having kids, I would be just obsessively, you know, in front of some sort of set of speakers, whether it's speakers in the studio or speakers on stage and, and just crafting and, and working out some sort of musical something, whether I'm on the guitar or in front of the drums or, or in the studio composing writing or producing or mixing because i like to do all that and now yeah things things kind of change you have to be there and and it's not a have to it's a get to that's what i have to always have to remember and those things change but that brings you a lot too you know like like we have a nanny that's here and i i just walked in for a second before we started recording this podcast today and uh the baby was crying baby little baby julia who's four months old and i thought you know i I do have to go out and record this show right now and well, I could be late in a minute, but it, it hurt my heart that the baby was crying and <laughs> I just had a feeling I'm, you know, I'm kind of her, her dude. I'm going to pick the baby up and she's going to feel comforted and then she'll be cool to go down for that nap. And that's exactly what happened. And that's, it's, and D, you know this, it's like so invigorating. <laughs> you can bring comfort to a, a, a small human who's your human. And yeah, that that fills you up, man. Even if I'm running on two or three hours of sleep, there's that that recharges you fast. You know, it doesn't literally give you the rest back. <laughs> it doesn't clear the brain fog, but yeah, that that helps. So, long answer to a short question. I love to be able to have some some me time where I'm working on music, not just for clients, but like writing my own stuff and having fun and just fleshing out ideas and playing with pedals and just geeking out. And then uh some exercise, some family time, all that good stuff, man. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. It's a long answer. No, yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's great. I can endorse the exercise bit. And as long as you keep it fun. I hate running for the sake of running. But I, I'll mask the fact that I'm running with some basketball. Recently, my wife and I have been doing push-ups and sit-ups every day at home. And that's actually like affected how well I sleep as well. And, and mm, mornings. Yes. Um. Yeah, and a sense of accomplishment because it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's there's a um, uh, psychologist uh, Jordan Peterson once said that uh, legend the happiness so happiness doesn't come or sorry I, it's not necessarily a quote but it's more of an idea um, where he talks about that true long lasting happiness or self-satisfaction only comes from increased levels of responsibility. Wow. So increased responsibility. So that's saying like, because the more things that you're responsible of and the more things that you're able to take care of, um, the more 
satisfied you can feel about yourself. So the in his argument, because he's a psychologist, he's talking about like antidepressants and and if if you're depressed, then you just need to get your shit together. Yeah, you, you know, like like you don't need pills, you need to take care of yourself. And and if you are taking care of yourself, if you're going to work every day, you're not shirking off any responsibilities, but you're still depressed, then that may indeed be something to look into like chemical enhancement there with with medication. But I think that this is a big thing. And especially as a father, like as as we can relate to, right? Though I think that, yes, there are many times when you look seen on the outside, my son literally shits on the floor, like, <laughs> like in the middle of the living room. <laughs> Recently in the last like month, like at least once every other week, you know, it's it's a hassle. Like from the outside, all you see is crying, annoying, you know, all this stuff. But at the same time, there is this inner sense of peace and joy that I cannot, like, until you really fully experience it, there's no way to fully describe it. Like, literally, the other week, or no, the other month, like, I was in the studio here because both of my sons woke up in the middle of the night and my wife was taking care of the older one in the bedroom. And I took my young boy, Kyo, and I brought him in the, here in the studio room. And, uh, and I was just like, you know, patting his back, like, tapping him quietly, and the nightlight was on. and and. I looked at his face and just for a moment, just for a moment, I thought I saw my own face on him. Mm. And I just started weeping. Like I could not like, then I was filled with love and gratitude and every single thing that, cause like, think about this, right? With all the love in the world, this motherfucker, right? <laughs> is a year and a half years old. He was born prematurely. He's He's got Down syndrome, so he's got special needs. He, we have to go to doctors constantly. He's expensive. He was in the hospital. So much hassle. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't give it, I wouldn't give it for the world. And no. even if you ask me if I would rather, if, if I could use the CRISPR DNA editing and have a normal baby, and make my life slightly easier in that sense. Would I? Absolutely not. No, he's your dude, yeah. man. <clears throat> yeah, and and I think that goes into like other things too. Like, let's go back into music. Sorry, that was like a super no, I love it thing. <laughs> you know, but, I think I'm about to call Anna and be like, "Hey, have my baby." <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, but uh, <laughs> but I mean, I think this goes on to like owning a business for mixing, like working with friends. I think like when you work with friends, there's a sense of responsibility. Like you really feel like, okay, I'm part of the creative process. This is my baby, you know, to a certain degree. And, and you care a lot more for it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's this, the pressure of accountability too, that, that can really help, you know, like I really don't want to let my partner down. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> I've, I've always, it's funny because what you were talking about earlier, like you see this pattern. I've always, said not even jokingly like i haven't said that there was a pattern but um whenever people ask me granted i'm not the most successful person ever but whenever interns kind of ask me oh dk what's what's one of the secrets somewhere on my list i always say i got married young and i had kids young and mm. that is definitely one of the secrets of success cuz if some if there's nothing in the world that puts a fire under your ass it's getting married <clears throat> and having to feed two mouths and then having kids <laughs> There's nothing else that gets you more motivated to put in real work. God, I totally agree. I had a buddy the other day who asked. He's like, man, we're, I'm thinking about having kids. With, you know, we're thinking about doing it. But like, you know, I'm, we're not really at the level like where I feel like, ah, did, did it hurt your output? Did it, you know, did you backpedal a little bit career-wise? And it's like, no, <laughs> I got way better at mixing because I had such limited time that first year uh, that, that it, it's just like, it was fight or flight almost with the mixes and with the skills. And, and there's, there's a sense of, uh, man, a sense of direction that becomes really clear, I think, too. And I'm not sh sure what to attribute that to, but yeah. I, 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 we were talking about this too. Like Lou and I were talking about, and I think this goes both in business owning, mixer, parenthood. Um, we have a large team of interns, right? And we're always looking for more interns, right? And, and we, I think we have a really good system. We teach them every Wednesday morning. We have classes. We every we have awesome. weekly like uh, real session opportunities where I throw them in the chair sometimes to help them learn how to track right and you um, yell at them it, it, and all this Smack stuff. Like up. when we yeah, there you go. So like <laughs> when it's just me, when it was just me at Cold House Studio in Utah, negotiating my prices was 
like, yo, I'm willing to do this for free. I'm willing to do this for really cheap because it's just me and it doesn't hurt anybody else. Um, now it did hurt my wife, but <laughs> you know, but, but now it's like, it's, if I take on a discount, if I negotiate myself down, it's hurting Lou, it's hurting the interns. It is hurting my two kids and my wife. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm actually working less, but my output is just as big, if not bigger, because I'm now prioritizing myself mm -hmm. and not in a selfish way, but for selfless reasons. Because if I take a discount, that's less food on the table for my wife and kids. If Absolutely. we take a discount for the studio, that's, you know, that's, that's one <clears throat> different thing. <clears throat> totally, man. And, and setting, setting the right kind of rates too. Like I remember you had a couple of the years, and maybe you're still on this, but uh, you know, up to like a thousand mixes a year. It's like, man. And it's like you could probably… It sounds like you're kind of on this path now, but I, I hit the same thing around this. I've never got to that many, but I, I hit a certain way of thinking that was like, you know what? I bet I could charge roughly, I don't want to say like 10 times more, but <laughs> something crazy. I could charge way more and probably work way less. And a lot of those clients will still come back. And it was amazing that that, that prediction, that hypothesis completely sang true, you know? And there's there's such a a crucial aspect to work life balance. Oh, it's like absolutely. you you really can't, I I can't I can only speak personally to me, but I can't give my best self, the best version of myself to a client or to their work if I'm if I am overworked, and I go through these seasons where I'm and I can look back like, you know this I shouldn't even say this out loud, but like this is the way that it's been historically. When I'm really busy, I can look back and listen to those mixes and I can tell. <laughs> The, yeah. But when I have weeks like this week where I have one album to work on and I've gotten to spend the last three days on two songs, like really digging in, like, dude, I mean, these will go down in history as like my favorite songs I've ever mixed. It's, I'm, I'm trying to find systems now that will allow me to mm -hmm. be able to spend a few days on a song instead of having to like cram so much. And I'm definitely speaking from a point of, uh, of uh, privilege because it's obviously… You know, we all, we all are dreaming of, of being able to be in that position. But of course, yeah. Of course. They, I don't know. These are just things I'm thinking about. Like, I don't even know if I want to be Jason Joshua with 50 billion songs a year anymore. I look like a crazy person. Look at my hair, Jesus. <laughs> um, I, like, I want to be like a good dad who gets to mix some really, really quality artistic songs that that are impacting a lot of listeners, and that's. Yeah, that's kind of the direction I'm heading now. I'm trying to. It's kind of a tangent. I don't know why, where I went with no, that. No, that's, that's, I think that's good. Um, <laughs> talking about tangents, I'm going to take one as well and bring up uh, a couple things that you've brought up in the past, which <laughs> I think is very interesting. And uh, some, practical, some practical advice that you may have and, and kind of started, I would say pioneered and, and marketed, pushed forward by you. Uh, let's talk about the no desk. <laughs> Because I know right now, minimal or no desk has been a craze in LA and throughout the country, throughout the world right now. As you see, like, this is my little home studio setup where I do a lot of mixing from home. <clears throat> so the studio can get booked out. And, and um, I have this tiny minimalist desk. And let's talk. And you have no desk. You mm -hmm. put the keyboard on your lap. Let, how did that start? Why, why does it exist? Why do you recommend that? Uh, you know, there are there are a lot of anomalies and, and strange issues that happen when we're talking about the physics of sound waves and, and reflections and, you know, null points and just all the awkward stuff that, that happens that I truly don't really know a lot about. But I do know that I had an Argosy 70 series, just monster, monster desk. <laughs> like every piece of gear I had sitting in front of me uh, you know, and all of that shiny reflective stuff was just bouncing the sound right back up at my face. So the speaker, you know, the sound leaves the speakers, hits your ears, but it also leaves the speakers and goes every other imaginable direction. And, you know, it goes down and hits the desk and then it comes back up and hits your face, you know, maybe a few milliseconds later, the travel time is longer. So it, it hits your, you know, uh, it interacts with the other sound waves coming straight from the speakers. So you get this just distortion and this phase smear. So everything I was hearing from the low end all the way up, especially in the mids, but all the way up to the top end, to the way that 
S's were presenting themselves. Like I, I can listen to everything I did from like 2018 to 2019 and think, wow, I was over DSing because I was hearing the way that that abrasive dome tweeter was bouncing around my room and presenting false uh, information. And the instant that I got rid of the Argosy and sat in my room, it was cool. And then I brought in this kind of smaller desk and it became a little less cool. <laughs> so I, I took it back out. And I thought, hey, everybody sits with laptops in their lap. I've been doing that my entire life. Like, I want to just get a keyboard that's the exact size of a laptop, that weighs, that feels like a laptop. And that's what I got. I got this, this um, Bullet Train Express keyboard platform. It holds the Apple Magic Keyboard and the Apple Magic Trackpad right below it. So the orientation is exactly what a laptop is. It's like if you ripped the screen off of a laptop, that is what sits in my lap. And then in front of my leg, you know, I just look down and my legs are there. <laughs> I can see my legs. And uh, it's like a hi-fi listening room. You know, I have some like st- hi-fi stereo geek friends that that's what their listening room is. It's just them in a chair and then the speakers standing on the floor in front of them. Nothing else. You know, a couple power amps, monoblocks. But th- that's the whole vibe. And I don't even have a rug, you know, I just keep it keep it pretty open in here and yeah i don't know it's working for me i might go back to a desk someday maybe like a if i'm gonna go to a desk though i'm gonna do it right it's gonna be an ssl e-channel console (laughs) nice there you go it's gonna be a console yeah it's kind of funny because like i remember somebody asked me um and it it honestly made me fall to the floor laughing because after they mentioned it i could not unimagine it um, they said, so people that use like a deskless setup, what is it exactly? Like, is it like one of those school desks where like the arm flips down? And I was like, honestly speaking, I would die if I walked into a studio and they're like, oh yeah, you're going to run a session at Paramount today. And that's all there was just like a school table. And then the Augsburgers, <laughs> like I would die laughing and like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, okay, I'm so down for this. I'm the one student in the room. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Like, yeah, that's actually. Desk. That's kind of hilarious. I, I, like, I wish pull, to see that. Pull the arm back out. Like, yeah, it's like, all right, time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so Reset. another con- yeah. that, that goes back to the thought too, though. Like, Because like you said, uh, like Jesse, along with many others, has been very well known for the no desk setup more recently. Um, do you ever see it going commercial? <clears throat> I think this mean? is very personal studio-based setup because I don't think you could book out um, a commercial location with that style because it, like we've talked about many times, there's clients who book the, the, the specific individual and they'll go wherever the individual feels is best for the project. And then there are those who book the room and not the individual and they'll just go with the room that looks or seems to be the best bet for their needs. Mm-hmm. But would a deskless room be the first one booked or is it even being considered? Yeah, definitely not. Definitely yeah. not a commercial so that's, that's where it's like, yeah, well, usually when I see these setups, I don't think commercial, I think personal. But at that point, there also is a sense of, yo, know, I'm kind of curious about this person. They know about the no desk setup. And so they must have some understanding of acoustics. It must be a mixer of some kind. Yeah, a mastering <laughs> engineer of some sort. Like, I want to meet this person. So, like, I've, I've been looking at it that way. You know what intrigues me is the idea of a hi-fi community. And people that really, really take care and pay attention to the art of listening. Yeah. And and I watch a lot of like hi-fi videos and like tutorials and like these people talking about how they listen in their different setups. And and it always comes back to like gear at the end of the day, unfortunately, fortunately, however you want to say it. But it's very interesting to me where at the end of the day, again, it comes back to, yo, we as audio engineers, oftentimes hi-fi enthusiasts really look up to mastering and mixing engineers, right? And like, because they're part of making the record, but I don't think we care half about half as much about what we're listening to as much as these hi-fi enthusiasts. Like, I think listening is an art and a craft in itself for sure. And and I, and it feels like you've kind of been able to find the two. You've been able to without the desk, you've been able to enjoy the experience a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I am obsessed with hi-fi like system stuff. <laughs> like I've. I'm like a recovering, you know, guy uh, from the addiction of like (laughs) hi-fi cables and 
you know, super intense cables and crazy. I'm like trying out this new crazy power amp that's like worth more than my car right now. And yeah. Oh, the one from uh, Strauss? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I saw that one. I was I was looking into that before you posted about it. Dude, so it's on crazy. A, on a practical level, how much of a difference has it made on your mixes? Um This is such a good question and I'm I'm getting into this more and more cuz I feel like I've I've hung around the right kind of guys, you know, guys and gals that that have taught me what to look for and and how to listen to to these really, really, really close comparative items and make discernible uh, different and be able to pick out the discernible differences. You know, you listen to reverb tales, you listen to, you know, for the depth and and the way that there's distortion and, and you know, clarity and texture of top end. I feel like I have, I have, am evolving and, get, and really getting there. So you with that being leave. said, I read things that people say about this equipment and I re- hear things that other engineers say about non-hi-fi equipment and i just i can't tell if i don't believe you guys <laughs> or I'm like i think that there is so much emphasis placed on this stuff that just does not matter and i mean and all the way down to like something like oh well uh the i read an argument earlier today because that the new ssl ev2 channel came out from waves it's the remade ssl e channel eq channel strip and we've all been using that Waves plugin for the last, you know, what, 13 years it's been out. And people are comparing like, well, the Plugin Alliance one versus the UAD one versus the Waves. Well, here's the, here's the real thing. And just like spewing out this garbage, just regurgitating some nonsense that, that is just complete nonsense. And I, I would just urge anybody to, to really like ba- back up these claims. <laughs> Let's do a blind test. I bet you will not pick them out. You know, the funny thing is, like, <clears throat> I've always told people, like, the idea of the comparison of, like, the reason I like plugins that don't emulate something old, unless it's, like, like okay, like a Fairchild, very mute, whatever. Like, okay, there's certain flavors we're after, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's more of a way that it distorts the signal rather than anything else. Now, when I used to work at, like, different studios like Paramount and all that, like, working with my clients and all that, not one channel sounded exactly the same. Not one right. channel wasn't repaired differently than the other channel was. So, the reality is, you would sometimes, if you were being that specific on a record, choose the channel specific to the source, or you just got what you got. That's it. You either made it sound good or you didn't. It wasn't because it was a specific repairman that worked on this one or a specific repairman <laughs> on that one that made or broke the record like it literally did you know what you were doing with it because if you didn't that was the issue yeah and i saw another one today uh you know shout out uh um J- uh, john mcbride blackbird they have their new company kit plugins and they, they made a really great neve mm. emulation i did, I did uh, see that just that came one, out i didn't i heard some this samples i haven't used it have you guys tried this no, no i uh i only saw i was hanging out with bob and i saw him use it he he was he just liked it. I didn't even try it myself. I'm gotcha. Curious. Yeah. I mean, apparently it's fantastic. But I was reading a comment below it, and this kid was like, "Oh, finally somebody makes one that that actually sounds good and holds up." And like all these other companies are getting it wrong. I'm like, dude, what the hell are you talking about? Wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I have to ask. I have to ask because I've I've had to ask myself this in the past. Do you know how old the kid was? Because like, there's there's a very specific difference between. People who really know what a real Neve sounds like and people who have used like a, a clone of a Neve or, or use a modern Neve. Like, which which one are you comparison? Like, right. you know? Well, dude, yeah. even so, Comparing. like to somebody like Andrew Sheps, who I think knows how a Neve sounds yeah, yeah. probably more than any other living human being on the planet, literally has spent probably more time in front of that desk than anybody. Yeah. Big claim. I don't know. But... <laughs> But dude, the dude has been using just the basic like waves, his like whoosh, you know, and I know that he uses that for real. And yeah, actually, I I like the Shep seventy three. Dude, dude, that is a bad boy. Great. Yeah, yeah I, I use it all the, the time. The top actually. end is nice on it. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the top end repair like the really dull sounding recordings in a way that like yeah, it can be a little bit bitey, but I kind of like it. So it kind of goes back into, and I think we've brought it up briefly in previous episodes in the past, but I wanted to actually like sit down and do a full episode about this but the idea of 
Because I, I do think to a certain degree, finding the difference, recognizing that there is a difference, and, and finding a more true emulation to a certain degree is important, but not at all is it practical. No. Not at all. Like, for example, I really do think that summing or um, really high-end converters can make a great difference on the sound. That being said, practically speaking, if this summing just makes it feel less bright and a little bit deeper, I could do that with an EQ. I should have just mixed it better, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and or we could take that in any direction. Like, yes, is the fa UAD Fairchild really like the actual Fairchild, the one in Capital Record, whatever? Right? It doesn't matter. It's it's not practical. Like, it's not going to change the way I mix. If if my mix sucks, it's not because the emulation wasn't true to the proper thing. It was because I sucked. <laughs> I mean, are you going to push back deadlines to get the real thing? Yeah. It, <laughs> there you go. There you go. So it's, it's I think that, and I don't want to say that it's not important because I do want, I, again, I don't want to lower the standard to 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 a level like, but at the same time, I do think people pay too much of an emphasis on things that are not practical. How about instead of saying not trying to lower the standard, how about trying to raise the bar of expectation? You know, if you call yourself a professional, you should be able to hold yourself up to, and, to a certain standard. So instead of lowering the standard by saying if you don't have it, you, uh, it's a weak claim to say that you can't make it happen. How about if you don't have it, you were still able to make it happen? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. And on another note, there are some pieces of gear that I have no idea what the heck it's doing. It's it's magical and it works wonders. For example, the retro stuff. Mm. No, oh, I was gonna mm -hmm. say mm. I've I'm really an anti gear guy. Like not not anti, but pretty close to anti. Like I'm all about practical and effectiveness and efficiency. Okay, <laughs> I sat down and Bob showed me first, and we did it together as well. The Lynx Hilo mastering. Uh, Interface, converter thing yeah. when you print through that thing it, it felt like the song was out of phase it did like most summing things that i've heard it's like oh there's some saturation there's some eq like i can do this with a little bit of an eq and a little bit of saturation here maybe with some specter i can like kind of like guess it but with that it just felt like the song was out of phase and all of a sudden i just put it in phase it's really weird. I just don't know how. To, like that weird. was some. That was one of those things like, where it's like, oh. Like I remember we did different tests between like my tech symphony and a bunch of different things, and we found like certain converters made it sound like, oh yeah, it sounds wider, but we lost part of the transient. We lost like it almost like snipped off some of the punch. But then on this one, it sounded exactly the same. It just kind of hit harder and felt fuller. But that being said, it goes back to. Will the label accept a record if it's coming out of your? Uh, 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 I mean, I don't want to share one of your secrets. Coming out of your optical, Girl. optical built-in <laughs> converter from the output of your computer. Yeah, that's all I'm doing these days. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you actually. I noticed that uh, you use the 905, mm -hmm. but I remember uh, one time I was looking at a picture of your setup, and I was like, "Is he just using the built-in DAC?" Or like, what is going on on the setup? Because I have the one with the built-in DAC. Yeah, that's what I use for for listening, for monitoring. Like, um, question. Yeah. Have you found, because I found this to be a thing, but I don't know why it is. So I've just completely just went with what worked for me. I will listen to something at 48 kilohertz on their DAC, and I'll listen to something at 192. And can, granted, I'm using the USB uh, section of it. So I don't know if that's why, but. I could hear a major difference. And I don't know why. I remember I showed you that. Oh, you yeah. had heard a major difference. Did, was that a similar scenario when using this kind of setup for you? Or like, because I, I would say I'm I'm much more impressed to hear that even with all things fighting against you, you still cranked out amazing mixes. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Know you. What I mean? Well, fighting no. against you <laughs> as in like what people say would. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I haven't tried that. I'm not using USB mode, but now I'm I'm a little curious. Uh, I would try it. I'm curious to hear your opinion <clears throat> of it because I'm kind of confused and excited at the same time. That's cool. I think uh, a lot of uh, great things in my life have happened when I have been both uh, confused and excited. So. <laughs> I, I, I'll say like... I had a kid that way. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, <laughs> it was my first time. <laughs> I'll say for me, partially with all this stuff, um, I mean, obviously efficiency... And all that blah, 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 blah. But I think a part of it, too, is 
is I, I do actually care a lot and I like to compare and do comparisons and figure out. And yes, there's like, yes, if it sounds better, does it mean that your mix is going to sound better? Like, does how you listen out the specific speaker, like, is it going to be better to just change speaker? Like, I don't know. Does Sonarworks actually help you make better mixes? Who cares if it's more flat, right? Does it help me hear things better and make better decisions? But the, I think another level beyond that too is, it is just unhealthy for me personally when I get when I go full consumer mode and start thinking that all this stuff cares, all this stuff matters. Mm -hmm. It's it's just unhealthy for me, and and so for me to keep myself distance with that and, and try not to be a consumer in that sense is is partially for self protection of my mental health. No. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It, that makes sense. I, I, that's that's a big reason that I do what I do in the box. <laughs> and the biggest thing is I want to be able to give the best version of myself to the artist. That's, I've said that a couple of times already. I just keep coming back to it. That's primarily what I base every single decision I make around. You know, if I'm going to spend a penny on something towards an investment in the studio, which hardly ever happens anymore because I'm just profoundly frugal these days. If I'm going to do it, it needs to have a monumentally uh, noteworthy, like or tangible result in customer satisfaction and bringing in work. Uh, so the thing with me for being in the box and like not using gear is like, if somebody can hit me up, you know, on a Saturday and be like, oh, dude, you know, you delivered stems or three years ago, we have a project from way back in the day. Um, mm. God, could, could, would you be able to, you know, unmult the bass or mute the 808 in this section and then send us like a two track where we're, you know, we're sitting at the studio. We're about to do a, a an on air performance. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Because <laughs> before I would have to like pull up this this notebook I had, or like I had a photo log with was where the gear was sitting at, and and I actually ran into like one project that was actually pretty problematic with making recalls because I had sold this, the gear because I was selling stuff all the time and buying new gear. There you and go. it's just like, oh, dude, I want to be able to like get them that within the hour, and I'm able to do that, and I do that a lot because, I mean, you guys know, you, probably in the time that we've been sitting here, one out of the three of us have gotten hit up to send some sort of alt mix <laughs> or send a stem or send stems. Like it's I'm just, not going to lie. I did check my phone because somebody hit me up for stems for a concert. Yeah, dude, it happens. Uh, yeah, <laughs> me that, too. Make that too. Make that too. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, same. I, uh, this girl just right. asked if I could do three of the songs, even though we're not done with the other ones. Um, they're getting oh, ready with them. <laughs> yeah, three for three. Uh, and, <laughs> I, and without a doubt, I, I know that I'm going to be able to pop those sessions open and make a quick stem prep for Bounce Butler in five minutes. And I'm going to set up Bounce Butler when I leave the studio in a little bit and go have, you know, dinner and hang out and have nighttime routine with my family. And Okay, you know what? Shout out to Bounce Butler. Yeah, shout out Chris Graham. Yeah, yeah, dude. Uh, that thing saved me, I kid you not, the other day, an hour and a half. An Is hour and a half worth of bounce. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying in a single day, an hour and a half worth of bounces on oh. a three minute song. Sweet. Well, various three minute songs, but I got asked to stem an entire album, uh, but into like different bus groups. And I, I was like, okay, I could sit down and do this and do like the whole Pro Tools output things and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, you know what? I want to play some video games right now. Bounce Butler. <laughs> okay, done. Bye. Yeah. Dude, yeah, I no, completely attribute, like, before we had our kid, Bounce Baller didn't exist yet. Um, and I would just, man, <laughs> I would be like, the, the, I specifically remember the African Giant album. 19 songs, features on every single song. Every song needed clean version. Every song needed radio. And then obviously the acapella instrumental TV, uh, regular mix, and then non-limbs and limbs of every one of those. And then they needed clean radio, uh, clean radio with uh, three minute versions. So edited off. So every single song had like nine or 10 different bounces. And I would sit and do this stuff manually. And I still know like oh. half of the industry is still a print to track. You guys might be print to track. <laughs> and they're still doing this. And I just, I can't believe it, man. <laughs> I'll it's, be honest. I am still a big believer in print to track if <laughs> I'm doing a summing. But I'll be honest, though, I do have a summing mixer and I do actually enjoy the end result that I get out of it because it's the the Rupert Neve 5057 with the with the blue saturation that I'm really mm -hmm. fond of. 
it's not on every track. So when I do have to do this, uh, I actually do a different trick. I actually, uh, instead of uh, doing uh, like the, the direct output, I'll do what like SSL recommends when they use, uh, what is it? The Sigma is their summing console mm-hmm. or Nucleus, whatever it's called. They say put the sends on the, on the, put the outputs on the sends. And if you do post fader, you can still use bounce butler while doing summing bounces. Oh, so that's crazy. I found, I found a loop around that literally takes me, what, two minutes to set up. Um, can, can you do me a favor? Would yeah. you send me, I'm, this is probably a big ask. I, I'm sure that you have versions, uh, like some test files of like a mix you did through that, oh, not yeah, with totally. that. And then is there a third one where you could just do it just that unit j- so only on the I'll master bus? I'll see if I can find the old ones that I did with Bob where we did um, no, uh, in, the, in the box, just run it through, run it through with red saturation and run it through with blue. And then we also did a burl with the transformer and without the transformer. Um, I'll see if I still have the files to that um, and I'll send you those. Is but it subtle? Not, is it like uh, night and day, like people say? The burl one is a little more subtle than I thought, but the blue and the red on the Rupert Neve are a lot more night and day, but that's because it has the knob. You can change the amount. And we actually decided to go ham with it, you know, just crank it up to max, see what the hell that thing is doing. And um, it was weird. Um, uh, I know DK was missing this day, but me, Eric, and Bob each took a listen and uh, me and Bob had listened to it first, and then we decided to tell each other what we heard after. And it was unanimous, like the little details we were picking up that we were enjoying. Then we said, like, hey, just, just as a test, just to make sure this isn't something like, you know, two guys talking and just agreeing with each other. How about we invite Eric in, ask him to listen to the before and afters, and then ask him for his opinion, just offer no opinion, no visual cues, nothing, just... Just see what his opinion is and see if it lines up with ours. And sure enough, he chose the blue setting over all settings. He said the next best was red. Um, in the box was next for him. And then, like, the Burl just apparently didn't land on it. Um, not, not, a, not a stab at Burl, but, like, obviously everything has a great tone for something. I'm not going to go bass heavy on a, on a... Well, actually, maybe I would go bass heavy on a metal mix now that I'm thinking about it. But either way, you know what I mean. Yeah, I, there's actually for the Neve one specifically for that one. There's actually a practical reason why it can be good. Um, you can get a little bit more volume because yeah. it does saturate a little bit, so you get a little bit more headroom to 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 li- when before going into a limiter. I found joy in the low end. You get a little bit more volume, so yeah. that that there is a practical application in that not just in sound. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, check for you. I I low key, I think like the top three. Big, loud, like bad boy, hot mastering guys right now. I'll never say names, but I, I have, uh, I have it on good authority that. No, I can't even say it. We got to cut this out. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, just dude, don't drop I, the name. I, at least, in, at least in my experience of what I've been doing lately, I think I'm getting the loudest stuff in the box with the most transient. Yeah, I won't speak to I what anybody it. else is doing. I guess I don't know, but yeah, it's just. They're at this stage in the game. Like uh, we were having this argument on the Mixland Discord the other day. People were like, "Tubes, real tubes, just add this 3D dimension and this depth. And plugins just don't do it." And I'm like, "Dude, it's just not true." <laughs> I yeah. think they do do it. I don't think we've emulated tape properly yet. Uh, but I think that, man, I I don't know. It's close enough for me. I love it. To be honest, I've I've had that argument with people, and I think we made an episode on this. Like, do does having gear really matter? And at the end of the day, I tell people this all the time. Um, did having the gear make me a better mixer? Fuck no. Um, did it make my business a little more appealing to to the consumer side of things? Fuck yeah. The reason being is like uh, we talk about like everybody always wants a Sony C eight hundred G, a ten seventy three, and a CL one B. Cool. And it seemingly that's is important. this like factor that people book studios on. And that that's fine. It's whatever you want is what you're looking for, right? Um, but is it gonna make you a better engineer? No. Is it gonna make your mix mix better? No. But is it gonna is it the sound many people are after? Yeah. So if you're going commercial, sure, having flashy gear is gonna be better on picture and on paper. So you might actually have more bookability as a commercial location, but as an individual. No. 
I will yeah, argue though. I, th- I think having a two fifty one or a C eight hundred is is completely going to make the song sound better. <laughs> oh no 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 no. You, yeah okay. The mic that's, is going to make the huge important difference. stuff. Capturing is is important. But is it going to make your mix better as a mixing engineer to to have this on the side if you don't really know what you're doing with it? Yeah, totally, man. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, um, before we get hypocritical, I think it's fair to say real briefly that I got an email this morning from Sweetwater saying that the Clark Technic Dimension D chorus box thing, oh yeah, it was on sale today for 70 bucks. <laughs> I was like, that's cheaper than the plugin, so I bought it. What? Yeah, I, I ended up buying it too. I saw the price, so I was like, you know Se- what? For 70 bucks, how bad could it be? Could it be worse than a plugin? Could it be better than a plugin? The $70 Who knows? Dimension D. It's cheaper D- than the plugin either way. <laughs> I'm Literally, I've been up. wanting a Dimension D plugin, and this hardware unit from Clark Technic is cheaper than all of the Dimension D clone plugins. I'm like, yep, all right, uh, that's worth. Like, if it's cheaper than the plugin, and the I shipping will, is free, I will take <laughs> a couple minutes each mix to to print it. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> all right, that's sick, man. Seventy bucks. So before we get to yeah, so that's funny. Um, on that note, uh, real briefly, another another thing that you talked about and you have been talking about on social media that I want to talk about. I think is important, and we can branch out into many different things. But I want to talk about your plugin as well and segue into that. Yeah. Uh, you you have mentioned many times on social media, which all of y'all can fall follow on Instagram, and you have a Discord server now. We'll talk about later. Um, but uh, you've t- mentioned not looking at the gain reduction meter when compressing. Tell us about that. Yeah, which is so funny because I, <laughs> even on our plugin where we like have the craziest gain reduction meter of all time and it's designed for such a purpose and I, I still cover it up. <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it did it today with an acoustic guitar. I just, I, I felt like it was telling me something that, that, that my ears it was con- uh, contradicting the information that that my ears were receiving and um you know is the listener going to going to see that when they pull up the song on Spotify like no nah, just going to hear it so why am i giving myself any sort of other sensory information um mm-hmm. i think it, it's really helpful to begin to learn by looking at meters and seeing the analyzer on pro q3 otherwise it, i just shut that stuff off cuz it, it really does influence me it, um, yeah, I, I find that a lot too. I mean, even with EQs, like, uh, uh, I'll find, and, and I've obviously I find this within myself, but when I'm like helping and, and in, young interns are shadowing me and I'm kind of training them, they'll be very conservative with their EQ movements because it looks crazy. And I'm like, no, you were right. Your gut feeling is right. That frequency sucks. You can yeah. pull it out more. Yep. <laughs> and, and you could yeah like the way that it looks definitely influences how you yeah it's the same reason i actually like eqs like the like the api 560 and things like that mm-hmm. it's just like that sucked Take some <laughs> of that that was kind of nice actually i like what that one did yeah Ooh. <laughs> yeah so, dude, I mean, dude you bring up a great point about that eq specifically uh because uh, you you bring up the word balance in a mix and people think, oh, balance. Yeah, he's, he's talking about, you know, where we're putting the faders. And it's like, no. <laughs> Tonal balance on the spectrum. Every single source, every single instrument uh, has a balance. So when you, got, you, know, you have a resonance in a vocal that's poking out, like, you know, 900, like, oh. That is suddenly throwing the teeter-totter out of balance, right? And so I, I love thinking about EQ notches and different bells and different bands as faders and pushing the mm-hmm. faders. That's why I love to, you know, throw a kick out on five different faders. You know, one for the, one for the sub decay, one for the push, one for the chest, one for the box, one for the splat, one for the smack, one for your slap, the presence. And if you could really quickly, like you know, I say, I do this with my hands, like I'm moving faders. I'm not, you know, I'm clicking, I'm moving them around. It's like, more like you're doing this. Yeah, I love the 560 because you can do that with it with a with a source. You just move through it. Like sometimes you know, I'll do a zero up mix where I'll just move through and just one fader at a time, just put it where I think it's working, and then do it again. We'll go back to the first fader because every relationship ch- changes now where those every, all of those need to live. Have you yeah. ever? Um, I found myself doing this recently. I don't know. I don't know if this is kind of a weird thing to do, but do you ever set up a challenge for yourself? Like I, lately, I've been doing the one plug in challenge for myself, which mm. is. Just throw up your favorite channel strip, 
or whichever channel strip you think is going to be best for that specific group. So like for me, I've, I'm a really big fan of the SSL 9000 on uh, the brain work stuff. Um, and I found relying on less and just no meters. Like I know it has the gain reduction in the gate meter and whatever, but mm-hmm. just like, you know, just use your ear and try to try to do less or do more with less. Um, I found myself getting myself a lot more natural mixes than when I'm like, oh, I'm going to reach for Pro Q3 and this one and this one and this one. Like I, I like building my own channel strip over different instances, but sometimes like you hear all these amazing mixes from back in the day. Like I, my dad was a big Pink Floyd fan. So I grew up listening to Pink Floyd and all that. And then you listen to some of their mixes and you're like, dude, there was like at one point four guys just on the mixer, just waiting for their cue to move the fader down, Mm -hmm. move the fader up. Uh, They only had like a four band EQ maybe available and like a few pieces on the side, but they didn't have a thousand plugins running, you know, and they still cranked out amazing mixes. Yeah. Also, I mean, shout out. David Gilmore, uh, if you don't have a good Christmas idea, g- Christmas gift idea for uh, your dad, get him the Return to Pompeii Blu-ray that's coming out. Oh, um, yeah, dude. God, that's awesome. I-, I love that the the collaborative band on the band on the console on the mixer. Yeah, idea. Like it was always like I grew up. Uh, I guess as an engineer, like when I was eighteen, like I got picked up by this. Uh, producer named greg hampton he did like alice cooper alita ford bootsy collins mm. you know ton, tons of the great stuff bootsy you know? bootsy but uh <laughs> it was just kind of funny because like everybody he introduced me to was like four times my age or three times my age you know but they were amazing engineers like i was blown away that like me thinking 20 year old me yeah you know i got my plugins i got my slate trigger yeah i can do like quantization on the drummer yeah but then this guy on this old trident a range console only using 16 channels outdid my mix by like years worth of education you know what i mean like i felt so humiliated in that moment that i was like it really is just the individual that makes the difference it it wasn't all the plugins in the world so i think this is a good point where we talk about um when when you you did this a lot with the pawn shop comp with Cornef. I saw you posting that a lot. Not looking at the gain reduction meter. You actually had a pop out window. I think it was like the about, like about the plugin or something like that, where it pops out and you covered the gain reduction meter with it. It's the force force quit applications command option escape. <laughs> really? Gives you the yeah. It gives you the Mac prompt. It's a window that floats over everything else. So even if you hit you know Pro Tools window again or you go back to Safari whatever, this window doesn't go away. So that, that's so, so why. Say, what's the command again? Command option escape. And Command this window will option. sit over whatever you put it over. And so you can then you can click the plugin and quick keep ticking. Oh, uh, you the can, force quit applications. You can continue to tweak uh, the knobs without this window getting hidden. That's why yeah, you use that one. Yeah, there you one. go. Yeah, That's and, a good and idea. You can, yeah, and you can cover stuff up and, and just go for it. Uh, to answer your question, Lou, yeah, I've been doing this challenge uh, the last couple of days. I've been doing like a minute off, a minute on. So I'll listen to the song down, make a really quick notes list of just rapid fire moves, like quick moves, like vocals muddy, uh, chorus vocal up, uh, you know, 11K strums on the acoustic guitar gets a little too crazy, automate some of those out. Uh, And then I'll go in and I'll make these moves in one minute and I'll take a break and I'll watch YouTube minute off ear break. And then I come back and I'll listen to the song fresh again. And then I'll just do these like. I don't know. It's just this like really quick thinking and then ta- immediately forgetting about what I did and forgetting the song. It's weird. I'm not even sure I really recommend it, but I'm... <laughs> I'm actually really curious to kind of try it just as an experiment. We, we talk a lot about mixing fast and the importance of mixing quickly as far as keeping oh, yeah. that intuition, keeping that inspiration. Yeah, because uh, otherwise you get lost and you start, you forget what the song sounds like and... Oh, absolutely. My and it's always surprising. It's always surprising. Like whenever I forget what a song sounds like and I start making stupid mix decisions and I come back to it, I'm always like, I did not realize I was that off. Yeah. Like- <laughs> yeah. No, my favorite meme is always seeing like, uh, what is it? 20 years later, still working on that snare, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so on that note, I actually have to wrap um, as well. And so uh, real quick, um, let's talk about your new plugin. So you have Mixland.io, which is the name of the website. You have the new rubber band compressor. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, this goes back to 
the, the philosophy that came from Michael Brower, where he, he imagined compression as just a big rubber sheet, you know, and you're just, you're driving energy into this sheet and you want to imagine that your threshold, your attack and your release, these are all factors that can adjust the resistance and the bounce of that sheet. And so, you know, when you push something into this rubber band, uh, you want it to kick back. So this one has this uh, kind of floating ratio thing. So the harder you drive into it, the more it's actually kind of snapping back at you. And it's a serial compressor too. So it's got two VCAs back to back. Because, you know, when you pull a rubber band with both hands, you can see that it's, it's actually two bands, not one running into one single. You're running into one band. And then after a certain uh, threshold point, you start to run into the second band, which has a oh. tighter resistance. I like this. It's kind of the harder you snap this thing, uh, you, you really get this explosive stuff going on. And uh, at the front end of it, we've got this really elaborate uh, Class A Neve preamp, this crunch knob that just mm -hmm. blows up the sound and also rolls off the top end. So, you know, as you're blowing it up, you're not getting fizzy, it's just kind of shitty distortion. <laughs> you're getting this really warm thing that we really doctored that forever to get it right. And then right after that is a, uh, a Pultec uh, shelving tilt knob. So sort of just instant shaping, you know, and we really work to get those curves right too. Because, you know, we have it's so like, you know, you start to boost 12K, but, uh, you know, after you get to a certain level, you're also boosting like 8 through 10K, which sucks. So then at that point, then it starts to cut those out. And then after you've boosted a bit more of that, you know, you, we start to bring in some 200 hertz too. So there's a really cool curve to the tilt. It's really musical. It's really mm. specific to how I like to mix. And I think it's really useful for, especially when you get like a, a, a trap or an R&B song where, where you pull up and there's a bunch of dark vocals, like a bunch of SM7 vocals. And you're like, what do I do to make this sound good really fast? And uh, what I do is put on the rubber band comp because you can get a very punchy, aggressive, transient, heavy, aggressive vocal. Give it a little bit of that warmth and that saturation and then turn up the tilt knob and you can just it's just an instant vocal curve that works for some of those dynamic mics and some of the cheaper condenser mics too. And it gives you just an instant sound. It's like, wow, this was recorded through a nice preamp. It's like, it sounds like a tube mic now. It's brighter. It's It's cool. And and for you rock yeah. guys, which, you know, maybe there aren't any rock guys, this thing is pretty ridiculous on drums. So yep. <laughs> it's Drum a fun plug-in. sounds amazing. Use. Vocals sound amazing. There's a lot of different sources that it sounds amazing on. And uh, yeah, very cool. I did actually, I'm very picky with my saturation, my drive stuff. And I did notice it felt like you spent a lot of time in that algorithm. It felt really good. Yeah, um, it's, it's sweet, man. Yeah, it's great. So what a great, what a great idea. What a great plugin. It is available on Mixland.io. Once again, M-I-X-L-A-N-D, Mixland.io. It is currently available for a, a surprisingly low price of $29.99. But hear me out on this. If you use code, Jesse has approved of this. If you use the code M-M-P-O-D, yeah. That is M-M-P-O-D-Y-E-A-H. M-M-P-O-D, yeah. yeah. You get five bucks off. And guess what? If you're listening and you're a fan of the show and you want to support me in the podcast as you want to support Jesse as well, you can purchase it, use the code. We get a little bit of a kickback when you use the code. You're supporting the channel. You're supporting Jesse and his family. 24 well. bucks. It's 24, it's 24 bucks. bucks. 24 bucks. It's a great plug-in, really awesome saturation, really great tilt, really great compression. Thank you so much, Jesse. Can you give us a little shout-out on your social medias, contact stuff that you're willing to share? Talk about your Discord maybe real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hit me up on Insta, and my link tree kind of has all the, all the stops. Uh, Jesse Ray Mix, J-E-S-S-E-R-A-Y Mix. <laughs> Can you say that deeper? <laughs> J-E-S-S-E-R-A-Y. <laughs> mix get in the zone in the I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use that as your ringtone anytime you hit me up it's gonna be mix <laughs> this was fun guys love you guys thank man you. you're, you're awesome I can't wait to hang out in person next time thank you Jesse oh, yeah, you gotta come it. by the studio yep I wanna come hear the speakers come hear those ATCs baby oh baby alright Domo appreciate it thank you so much have yeah. on that note happy mixing my friends and stay saucy woo one there you two, go. three yeah.